No, you'll never turn me to the dark side. This, by the way, is lightsaber, a little freeware novelty for the Nokia N95 that takes advantage of its built-in accelerometer. Stop watching before the end of the show and I'll cut you in half with my, uh, well, my smartphone. If you're interested in fancy sensors and interfaces, note that my colleague Rafe from All About Symbian has put up a great article looking at the future of S60 and smartphones over the next few years, rolling in touchscreens with mechanical haptic feedback, proximity sensors, accelerometers and so on. Between Apple's high-profile innovation and Nokia's technical might, 2008 and 2009 look pretty exciting. It won't have escaped your notice that Nokia just launched the N82, which even manages to out-camera the N95 by virtue of including a genuine Xenon flash to accompany the usual 5 megapixel camera and VGA video recording. Apart from having a smaller screen, it's in many ways a candy bar version of the N95 itself, and just about the only things I didn't like the look of were the painfully thin keypad keys. I'm looking forward to giving this a detailed review in Show 49, and one feature I've especially got my eye on testing was acquiring an initial focus at the start of each video clip. HTC have just announced the Touch Cruise, which has the same touch flow interface from the original Touch and Touch Jewel. The unique selling point here is a new wheel control on the front and built-in GPS functionality and TomTom software. Under the hood, of course, are Windows Mobile 6 Professional, and there's both 3.5G connectivity and Wi-Fi. As per 2008 spec, there's also a 3 megapixel autofocus camera. Thanks to all of you that wrote in about my text input feature in Show 47. All good reading. But the main thing I wanted to show is a tip-off from Jonathan Brewer, who points out that if you're interested to find out officially how fast you can enter text on your smartphone or communicator, you can go to this URL, designed for the likes of the iPhone, but working well in the browser on most mobile devices. Just type in any text that comes to mind and hit the button for your words per minute score. Talking of iPhones, initial reports in the UK seem to be somewhat contradictory, with some sources claiming it is a wild success and others talking of empty stores and poor take-up. Watch this space for some hard figures. After one of the longest beta test programmes I can remember, Opera Mini 4 finally got finished. Head for mini.opera.com on your smartphone. Highly recommended. Opera Mini is a fabulous and free proxy-based web browser that runs under Java but compresses content hugely and thus saves time and money, working on just about any device to let you browse around full, unabridged websites. Following the release of the native Google Maps for Symbian S60, Google decided it's high time to also upgrade its Windows mobile-based Maps application. It's no longer a Java midlet and runs much faster. The new version 1.7.1.4, if you're counting, features several updates including functional route mapping and clearly marked turn points on every loaded map. It's a nice addition from Google, although I still don't understand why they don't add voice navigation. Do I smell a premium version coming up? Version 2.1 of Nokia's free mail for exchange is now out with support for the N81 and an N95 8GB, plus auto-configured heartbeat and with the company directory application supporting the global address list lookup feature. I'm assuming you know what that is if you're an exchange user. Uh, now available as a standalone application via its own .sis file. Looks good for company take-up of S60 smartphones. As something of a dabbler in Pi S60, Nokia's open source port of the Python programming language to S60, I was excited to see the arrival of a proper book on the subject. Mobile Python takes a tutorial approach, leading you from the ubiquitous Hello World right through to phone-controlled robotics and multiplayer online games. It's a heady and sometimes uneven ride, but Mobile Python does manage to get across a lot of the information while simultaneously firing the imagination of anyone who ever wanted to write an application for their phone. Finally, breaking news today, Nokia just released their version 20 firmware update for the Nokia N95 Classic. Go get it. There's loads new, including 50% more free RAM, uh, extra applications and faster operation. If I had to pick two devices from the current phone world that had people salivating from one end of the globe to the other, then it would surely be the Apple iPhone and the Nokia N95 8GB. Both stylish and black and silver, both with more or less full face, high contrast displays, both with eight gigabytes of storage, both with great image browsers, great web browsers, great music and video playback, both able to work in portrait and landscape mode, both great for running Google Maps natively, but with a myriad of differences in terms of interface and under the hood. But which of the two is best? I've reviewed each in turn in this show, and it's true that the iPhone is far superior in terms of interface while being far inferior 
in terms of actual functionality. Uh, no 3G, a lowly fixed focus camera with no video recording, no third party apps for games, no GPS, and so forth. But let's put each to the test in a series of day to day tasks with the aid of fellow smartphone fan and iPhone user Matt Radford. Calling your partner. Speed dial is of course present on the N95 being a traditional phone, which means that my wife is only a single button press away. Although I'll admit that new users do have to know how to burrow into settings to turn speed dialing on. The iPhone has an equivalent feature, favourites in the phone application, although calling a contact does then take one or two more taps than traditional phone speed dials. Let's see which can get to a website the quickest. In this case, we chose bbc.co.uk with the iPhone quicker to enter the URL thanks to its virtual QWERTY keyboard and better served when the page had loaded, while the N95 was served at the low bandwidth mobile version of the BBC site. Very annoying and ironic given that both devices have essentially the same WebKit web browser. The iPhone's web browsing generally was more pleasant and often quicker, although its lack of flash support does restrict the sites that can be fully browsed. What about navigation? Planning a route from my house to an address I know quite well 20 miles away was very interesting. Although the N95 had a head start by knowing the start point exactly via GPS, again the QWERTY input on the iPhone helped it get the destination entered in double quick time. Unfortunately, its, well, well Google Maps' calculated route was pretty strange, routing us round back roads that I just know are much slower in real life. Nokia Maps on the N95 8GB often criticised itself for strange routing, came up trumps this time with a perfect calculation. Now, music is a cornerstone of the iPhone's existence, so it should be pretty slick in terms of finding and playing tracks. Although quite intuitive, the interface proved no faster than that on the N95, with both arriving at a song chosen by the other owner at around the same time. The iPhone's renowned cover flow wouldn't have helped here, by the way, as it becomes cumbersome once a lot of music is loaded up. Another day-to-day -day task is entering an appointment in the calendar. We tried entering the same 11-word test, but the iPhone again won because of its really rather nifty pop-up keyboard. Having said that, I'm not the world's fastest predictive texter, and especially not with the phone held at an angle freeze of filming as here. Still, a win overall for the iPhone. Talking of texting, surely something we all do many times a day is send an SMS. Matt and I tried writing a message in freeform text of our own choosing, of up to 160 characters, the SMS limit. Interestingly, the iPhone is no character counter, meaning that you've got no idea at which point you're going to go over the magic 160 and be charged for sending a second overflow message. Text input speeds for general words were fairly similar here though. The N95's predictive text works rather well without the restriction of artificial names and punctuation. Taking a photo, a snap, is a common task for everyone. I didn't want to bias the test against the iPhone too much as it hasn't got a focusing lens or flash, so I picked an indoor object that was adequately lit. Here's the pretty great 5 megapixel photo from the N95. Here's the iPhone's attempt. Good enough for most people? I guess it depends on the sort of photos you like taking. After snapping, the idea was to email the photo immediately to a contact, an operation which proved easy enough to do with both devices although the iPhone insists on reducing every photo to VGA resolution, and there's no way to turn this behaviour off. Very annoying. The final test was going to be searching for a specific text note nominated by the other person, but the iPhone doesn't seem to have any way to search its contents of text in any application. So we had to abandon this section. The N95, by the way, has a full quick match search utility across all content types on its home standby screen. You'll notice that I haven't dished out any scores for this head-to-head, -head, although they would end up roughly equal for the tests mentioned. There isn't really much point in doing scores because, despite the overlap areas mentioned at the beginning, there are still ways in which the devices are so very different. For me, the ability to run third-party games, the video recording at DVD-ish quality, and the GPS swing things very definitely for the N95 8GB, while the slick Mac integration, the large display uh, and web browser and futuristic interface swung things for Matt. With the iPhone on sale across Europe now, at least you can pop into a phone shop and try both smartphones for yourself.